Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. Anyway, so that's my message. You're thinking, what are you talking about? Because we're not to worry about tomorrow. We're not to worry about what we're going to eat. Because of, you know the, but the and we know we all know that verse. But what I'm talking about is we never should stop thinking about what we're going to do in to raise the kingdom for tomorrow. We should never let a day go by that we don't think, what can I do to make somebody else's life better? Now, I know, I know that we really can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow, but we can prepare for what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, a few, years, a, a, few, um, uh, a few years ago, Newsweek reported on an event that happened, and it was at a fortune teller's convention in Dublin, Ireland. And at the, there was palm readers crystal ball gazers, astrologers from all over the world, and daddy says it, it's people that read the horrible scope. He always says that. But they were gathered together to come together to try to come into one mind of the new predictions that were going to come out for the next year. And while they were all together at the convention, somebody broke into all their hotel rooms and stole all their crystal balls and stole all of their tarot cards and stole all of the stuff that they were using in their convention. So I love this. When the police came to do the investigation of the crime, they said, why didn't you know this was going to happen? Weren't you all fortune tellers? Didn't you, all, didn't you already know that somebody was going to come in and break into your hotel room? I heard somebody say one time, Prediction is a very difficult thing, especially when it comes to the future. <laughs> and all of us, I mean, it's the same with the weather. How many of you have a weather app on your phone that you look at all the time? How many of you have a radar app on your phone? When you're always looking, I heard uh, the girl that's on Good Morning America, what's her name? Uh, Ginger Z. She said, maybe sometimes you should put your phone up and just leave it to a trained professional. On the prediction of what's going on. Because every one of us, anytime there's, I even have an app on my, my, um, my, my watch and my phone. It's called Dark Sky. And Dark Sky gives you an up to minute. And like, it, it may, in fact, it just did it before I came up. It said, drizzle ending in 10 minutes. That's what I said. And then it'll say, drizzle starting or, or precipitation for the next hour. Because it's giving me the prediction so I can plan on what to do. Um, I, I talked to Sue this morning when I came in, and I said, well, I said, our, our offices are closed tomorrow, Memorial Day weekend. I said, I guess we're not going to do any yard work, though, because it's raining. And Sue said, I'm thankful I ain't got to do none tomorrow. We need a day off. But nobody knows what the future is going to be. Nobody knows what the weather is going to be in the next 10 minutes, really. No, there's, and there's two things, look at this. There's two things that you cannot do about tomorrow, and there's one thing that you better not do about tomorrow. One. You can't presume. You cannot presume on tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow might never come. This could be the last day. The Lord could come back before we leave from this place today. Tomorrow may be your last day. So you can't predict. You can't presume on what tomorrow is going to be. Number two, you can't predict it. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and neither do I. If you did... You should go fill out a lottery ticket and know what the numbers are going to be. And one thing that you better not do, you can't do those two things. One thing you better not do is procrastinate. Don't procrastinate about tomorrow. And now what, do you, what do you mean, Pastor? Now, always, when, when we talk about a Christian walk, oh, let me say this too. The children are all in here today. Um, on the fifth Sunday of every month, I, this, I just, the, the, on the fifth Sunday of every, of the, every fifth Sunday month, um, we allow all the children to stay in here. So today is the fifth Sunday. We give all of our children's church workers uh, an opportunity to stay in the sanctuary with us. And so if the kids are in here, so if you see them fidgeting or whatever, just hand them your crayons and let them do what, what they're going to do for a little while. So anyway, we can't presume, predict, or procrastinate. But you shouldn't put off today getting ready for tomorrow 
just in case tomorrow never comes. I know that there's a lot of you guys and girls that are financial planners, and you come to people, and you talk about what is the plan for the future. What are you going to plan for the future? I did an article a, a while back about uh, with, um, with Ryan. What, Ryan, you in here this morning? Where you at? Yeah. I did it with, with, um, with Ryan, and what we talked about was legacy giving, giving beyond yourself, and something that young people could do to open up a way for them to be able to give in the future. And I'm, we're going to give you some more details on, on that, that later. But we talk about new beginnings. We talk about a fresh start. But we should not only celebrate the past, we, we should not only seize the present, but we need to claim what the future is going to be in our lives. And you say, well, how do you do it? You live today as if, it, if it's your last day, but you prepare as if it will not be. You prepare. We need to make sure that if tomorrow comes, then tomorrow is going to be the best day of your life. I love Joel Osteen when he says, today is your best day. But tomorrow is going to be a better day. Why? Because you've learned from what happened today. And you don't have to go through tomorrow what you went through today. Now, Paul says the way that you can do this and the way that you can accomplish this is by setting goals. And this is my text this morning. It comes from the third chapter of Philippians, verses 12 through 15. And this is from the, uh, this is from the Message Bible. And look what it says. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made. But, how many of you know when that's in a, in a sentence, you need to look for something that's coming behind it? Look what Paul says. I'm not saying that I have everything together, but I am well on my way. Can somebody say amen? I am well on my way. I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously looked out for me. Now, friends, don't get me wrong. Don't get me, don't, don't, friends, don't get me wrong. <laughs> By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the what? On the go, on the go. Where God is beckoning us onward to who? Oh, I love that. I am off and doing what? Ah, run. There's that word again. I'm off and running and I'm not doing what? I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on what? Those of us who want everything. How many of you want everything that God has for you? Whew, I love that verse this morning. I can tell you something about if you're not in the habit of of setting a goal. If you do not have goals, you have no direction. If you don't have goals, you don't have direction. Now, it's, Pastor, why are you talking about this? I mean, are we goal setting? Is that what we're doing? Are we trying to plan? Yes, that's what we're doing. I can promise you, at, at my house, I have goals. They may change from the time I get up until the time I go to bed. But you can believe this. One thing you'll hear at my house just about every day is, Check, check that off the list. I don't have to do that anymore. Can anybody say amen? Isn't it a good feeling when you're done painting something? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Check. Yogi Berra said this, and I love, I love Yogi Berra sayings. If you don't know who Yogi Berra was, he was a, a ball player for the New York Yankees. He said, you'd better be careful if you don't know where you're going because you just might not get there. And he also said, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. The gospel according to Yogi Berra. There's an old Roman proverb that says this, and I love this. When the pilot does not know what port he is heading for, then no wind is the right wind. Hmm. If you don't know what port you're heading for, it may give you a little bit of clue why you're not happy. And there is not enough wind out there to fill your sail with what you feel like that you need because you don't know where you're going. And every wind that comes by, you go that way for a little while. And you go that way for a little while. But you're waiting for the right wind to come. And that right wind is waiting, waiting on you to head true north. To head and know exactly where you're going. So, so in a sense, you cannot stop thinking about tomorrow. No, you can't do it. Now, we're not to worry about tomorrow. The Bible is, is specific on telling you, you don't worry about tomorrow, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. But you need to ready yourself for, for tomorrow. Do you think if Miss Vivian, was, stand up, Miss Vivian, 
If you don't know who Vivian is, she is our pastoral counselor. She's on our staff. She's been with us for over 30 years. And Vivian does a great job with all of our community action projects. If she doesn't prepare for those people that are coming, what do you think is going to happen when they start lining up waiting for food and waiting for clothes? It's not going to happen, is it, Viv? It ain't going to happen. They're going to run over you. So number one, pray for direction. Do what for direction? Pray for direction. Now, it's foolish to ever set a goal without consulting God's first. Why? God first. Why? Because he is the only one that knows the future. And so, if he's the only one who truly knows what the future is, then logic would tell you that he's the only one that can guide you through the future. Can you say amen? So, as you set goals, look at this now. Look at this, Lynn. You're going to like this. As you set goals, you need to pray that God will give you a God-given vision. And then God-given goals to match that vision. You need to pray that God will give you the right vision. And then give you the right goals to attack that vision. To attack it. But I want you to listen to this principle. When God gives you a vision, now look at this. When God gives you a vision, the vision never changes. But the plans to accomplish that vision may change. The vision's not going to change because when God gives you a vision, He's not a God that's going to change His mind because He said He's the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. So He's not going to change His mind when He specifically gives you a vision. But the avenue that you're going on may change. The plans may change to accomplish that vision. So how do you, how do you where do you get all this, Pastor? Look at this. Proverbs 16, 1 says, people make elaborate plans, but who has the last word? God has the last word. Look at this one. Proverbs 16, 9, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines what? The steps of a righteous man are what? Ordered. That's right. You can make plans, but the Lord's purpose, whose purpose? The Lord's purpose will do what? Prevail. It'll prevail. There's a practical illustration in the life of Paul that comes in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 and 2, and he said this. He said, then he came to Derby, to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son, I think this is so ironic, the son of a Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He's saying, he's the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but the father was not. He was well spoken of by the brethren who was at Lystra and Iconium. Now, what Paul was saying here, that he had a vision. He came to this place, and his vision was to preach to as many people as he, as he possibly could. Now, in this verse, he had already made plans to go to Asia, but the Lord changed his plans. Now, his vision for going everywhere that he could go and seeing everyone that he could possibly see, preaching and reaching as many people had never changed, but his plans changed. The avenue changed that he was on, but his vision never changed. That was exactly the advice that the Lord gives us. That's why it's so important to pray for direction, to not only ask God what he wants you to do, but then trust him to show you how he wants you to do it. So important to pray for direction, to not only ask God what he wants you to do, but then trust him. Do what to him? Do what to him? Trust him to know how he wants you to do it. In uh, um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Solomon gives us great advice. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. And don't, figure out, don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He is the one who will keep you on what? Focus up. I know, baby, that's a hard verse, ain't it? A woman came to uh, Dr. Charles Stanley one time. And asked this simple question. He said, Dr. Stanley, do you, do you believe a person can truly live by faith and still set goals? Great question. Do you think a person can live by faith? Living by faith does not, believe, not mean living off the seat of your pants. It means you know what direction that you're going in and believing that God is going to lead you in that direction and stay with you. That's the when your sails can fill up with wind. But Dr. Stanley said this, he thought about it, he said, absolutely, but the goals must be God's goals for your life. Do you believe that a person can live by faith and still set goals? The answer is yes, but the goals have to be God's goals for your life. Now, 
as you set these goals for your life, as you set out where you're heading, there's four questions you need to ask yourself about the goals that you're setting. Look at these four questions. Number one. Will it get me where I want to go, which is deeper and more intimate relationship with God, and accomplish what God wants me to do? Will it get me to where I want to go, which is to a deeper relationship with my Heavenly Father, and will it accomplish what God wants me to do? Will it accomplish what God wants me to do? Because let me tell you what, whether you believe it or not, every one of you is a minister. That's why the Great Commission says to do what? Go. Go and do what? Preach. Teach. Talk. Save them. Get them in. You catch them. Let him do the cleaning up. So many, and this is a little bit, so many times we want to catch them and see that they're cleaned up. But guess what's happened? Guess what we do to a fish when we, cl when we clean it? We kill it. We gut it. That's why we bring the fish in and let the Heavenly Father do the cleaning. Because he's the only one that can clean a fish and not kill it. So number one, will it get me where I'm going, which is a deeper, more intimate relationship? Number two, I love this. Will it help make somebody else successful? Will the goal that I'm setting help to make somebody else successful? Right, Ryan? I mean, I, I think in your business, what you're trained to do is disciple someone else to be as successful as you are. To, to take yourself and to make a clone and somebody that can have a better idea than you ever have. But give them the training that you have. So will it make somebody else successful? I love that. Number three, do I have to violate a spiritual principle to get there? Self-explanatory. <laughs> will I have to violate a spiritual principle to get there? And number four. Will it fulfill God's purpose for my life? Will the goal that I'm setting fulfill God's purpose for my life? Now, if they number four, if you take the word God out of there and you put my, will it fulfill my purpose for my life? It's not going to work. How many of you know who Lou Holtz is? He's a famous football coach. I love to hear him talk. Lou Holtz wrote down 107 goals he wanted to accomplish before he died. 107 checks before he died. It covered everything from attending a dinner to the White House to skydiving. And uh, Holtz accomplished every one of those things. Every single one of those things he accomplished. And he said this, if you will set goals and follow through on them, you will transform yourself from one of life's spectators into a real participant. You will transform yourself from one of life's spectators to a real participant. The reason that we set goals is so important is this. It's, it's the goal that sets the plan. It's the plan that sets the action. It's the action that achieves the result. And it's the result that brings the satisfaction. Ooh, isn't that good, TJ? It's the goal that sets the plan. It's the plan that sets the action. It's the action that achieves the result. And the result in achieving your goal is what's going to bring you satisfaction every single time. Every single time. But it all begins with one word, goal. Goal. How many of you know who Lily Tomlin is? Lily Tomlin said this one time. She said, I've always wanted to be somebody, but I think I should have been more specific. <laughs> I've always wanted to be somebody, but I think I should have been more specific. That's one of the keys to setting a goal is to be in specific. The reason most people don't exceed in life because they really don't know what they truly want out of life. Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote this down. He said, one thing I do, one thing I do, I want to be successful at this one thing. Paul knew what he wanted to do, and he wrote it down. Psychologists have discovered that commitment to a written goal is three times as high as a commitment to a goal that we only have in our head. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Check it off. Oh, I just, I just don't do that. I don't write nothing down. And you don't accomplish much either. You don't even accomplish writing it down. <laughs> Research shows that 90% of us who have never written a goal in our life 
But of the 5% who have, they have achieved 95% of their goals. 95%. There's another thing that we need to do. And that's visualizing your goal. Visualize it. My wife, oh, I can see it. I can see it. I don't know how many times in our adult life she has said, I can see it. Can't you see it? I'm like, no. But she can tell me. I can see it. That's what Paul did. Paul, Paul said that he could actually visualize souls being saved. He said, I can visualize. I can see him being sanctified. I can visualize the Savior being satisfied with me. So in a sense... What you see is what you'll be. See it. See it. See it as something that you can accomplish. I see myself 10 pounds lighter. Amen? Yesterday, I, I helped my, my um, mother and father-in-law with a yard sale. And one of the boxes that I opened up, I was, we were opening up stuff to set it out on the tables for the yard sale. And, and we'll open this one box up. And she had one of these magnifying mirrors. You're, you know what I'm talking about? The magnifying mirrors, ladies. Why y'all ever have them things, I don't know. I have no idea why you would ever want to magnify. My big old head, when you get in there, I, it looks more like a basketball than it ever does normally. But when I opened that box up, that magnifying mirror was right there. And the first thing I saw was my big head. And I thought there was something coming out of that box to get me. Ha! <laughs> huh! And the next thing was a picture of my mother-in-law, and I really was scared of that, but it was okay. So, What you see is what you'll be. She did have some pretty dresses, though. I even tried one on. I ain't kidding. I honestly did. But I found there was a box that had a, a wig in it and a dress. And you know how the people do the, uh, the tax service stuff, and they stand up by the driveway, and they say, they spend the things that say taxes. I thought that would work for a yard sale, so I put that dress on and went by, and people were, oh. <laughs> nobody stopped. <laughs> Not a one. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> they were scared. No way. And it was in my mom and dad's driveway, so they even made it better. They thought it was my daddy out there. I heard about a guy that went to college as a freshman. And he before he went to his dorm, he went to the store and he bought a brass V. It was a big old brass V about that big. And he came to his college dorm and he put it on his door. And everybody thought that it was his last name, you know, what his last name started with the V. Nobody ever asked him what the V was for. But he knew exactly what he was doing when he put that V on his door. And every time he would walk in and out of his college dorm, he would see that V on the door. And for four years, he walked in and out of his door, and he looked at that V, and he would go into his room. In the morning, he would open the door, and the brass V was on his door. Four years later, he walked across the stage, and he was number one in his class, and everyone knew what it was. It was for valedictorian. And when he walked across the stage and got his diploma, he carried the brass V in his hand. Because he, had saw, he saw himself as the valedictorian every single day of his college life. And then what he saw is what he had become four years later. Whew. Now some of you are here this morning that say, you know what, that's all well and good. You're, you're talking to Martin, or you're talking to other young people that are here, or you're talking to the kids at Camp Rockfish, because they've got all their life ahead of them, and it's okay for you to speak to them, and it's okay for them to dream, dream dreams. I, I, I'm, I'm a little older now. I, I, I don't feel like that, that I don't need to have goals, and I don't need to dream dreams. Well, let me tell you something. Never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. In the Bible, Caleb was 85 years old when he said, I want that mountain. Colonel Sanders discovered finger licking good at 70 years old. 70 years old when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now he's like 150, I guess. He's got to be. Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, introduced the Big Mac after he was 70 years old. Casey Stengel was the manager of the New York Yankees when he was 75. He started when he was 75. Picasso was still painting at 88 years old. 
Thomas Edison invented the mimeograph machine when he was 85 years old. You're never too old to dream. You're never too old to set a goal. You're never too old to see what you want to be in this life. Amen? So prepare. All right, number three. Have I got everything? Did I get number one and two? I skipped number two. Prepare for action. Sorry. Come on, Rhonda, stay with me. Prepare for action. Number three. That's number two. P R E P A R E. Prepare for action. Number three. That's a toughie. Prepare for what? Any of you ever face opposition? And those of you who didn't raise your hand, the person beside you went <laughs> and got opposition. Number one, two problems you're always going to face. You're always going to face foes. You're always going to face foes. Nobody ever encountered more opposition than Moses did, or Jesus did, or Paul did. And they were three of the most visionary, goal-oriented men in the Bible. Let me ask you something. Did, did these names ring a bell with you? Shemua, Shepat. Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Emil, Sethur, Nebi, or Gil. Know any of those guys? No, they're not like the starting lineup for the Saudi Arabian baseball team or anything like that. But they were the spies that went into the land that were sent out with Joshua and Caleb to investigate the land. And those guys are the ones that came back with a minority report and said the land couldn't be taken. They were the ones. What did they do when they looked into the land? They minimized their God and they maximized the what? The giants. Right. When they looked at what was in the land, all they could see is their God was too weak. That they were too small. That the task was too difficult. That the giants were too big. And I want to warn you something this morning. If you, if you haven't already found this out. The world is full of dream killers. Full of dream killers. It's full of people that tell you you can't reach your goals. That you shouldn't dream bigger dreams. That you shouldn't have bigger visions. That you shouldn't try to climb higher mountains. And I want to tell you something this morning. I want to say in front of all of you that I am thankful for our board of directors at Fayetteville Community Church that continue to dream dreams and continue to have vision and to continue to support what the vision of the Lord is here. And they are not opposition. They are not men and women that stand in the way of what the Lord is calling us to do. And I want to thank you men and women, and you know who you are, that are on our board of advisors for supporting our vision. Would you give every one of those men and women a big hand this morning? When, when we started talking about the school, Scott Jones, is one of, he's on our board of, or, of advisors. And I went to him and I said, hey, the time is here, boys. The time's here. We, we, got, we got to go on or we can forget it. And we started beginning to talk about all the different pluses and minuses and all the different things we began to say. And Scott stopped and said, Pastor, if you feel like in your heart this is the thing we're going to do, we support you 100%. And every man and every woman in there. And the daddy said, He said, in this room, we've always come in one accord. And he said, if we're all in one accord, and we agree that it's going to be done, then the Lord's going to bring it to pass. And I'm thankful to stand here today and say, our very first year of Riverside Christian Academy is over. We have more kids. We have more double the amount of kids that we thought we would have to begin with. And in the year 16, 17, this year, we are starting our ninth grade class. And Lynn Wheeler, I thank you for the job well done this year and for what you're doing. I thank you for our board of advisors and board of directors that have stood behind us. Looking to a future. When the men walked into the land, everything that they looked at, their, their vision was clouded by everything that was in the land. They couldn't see the grapes that were in the land because they were clouded by the giants that were in the land. Any of you in your own personal life ever had a giant in your land? There's always going to be people that's going to try to cloud your vision and destroy your determination. 
because they're always looking for the future in a rearview mirror by the things that have happened in your life. You can't do that. Look at, look at all you've failed at before. Look at all the things that you've tried before. You know you can't crank that lawnmower. You ain't never got it cranked before. A great man said this one time. A blind man's world is bounded by the limits of his touch. An ignorant man's world by the limits of his knowledge. But a great man's world by the limits of his vision. Mark it down. You're going to have foes when you try to reach goals and dream dreams. Another thing you're going to face, not only foes, but failure. You're going to face failure. You're going to try and you ain't going to get it. You're going to try and you're not going to get it. You're going to swing and you're not going to hit it. I've asked you this before. Guys that have a 300 or over, Travis, if you have a, over a 300 batting average, if you had a 400 batting average, which is four times out of ten, where are they going to put you when you retire? The Hall of Fame. Six times you blew it. Any of you ever blew it six times? No matter how noble your goals are, no matter how hard you try to reach them, no matter how hard that you, you're going to be tenacity, you know, have, you're going to have tenacity in trying to reach those things, you're going to fail. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. I read a story about a guy named Duke Rudman who was expelled from college when he began to work on the Texas oil fields. And he began, he began to gather experience in the different companies that he worked for. And he began a vision of wildcatting. And wildcatting in the oil industry is finding, is going out and looking for oil on your own. Just finding places. He set a goal that he said, you know, I'm going to become an independent contractor and I'm going to build my own business. And everything that he took, everything that he could make when he was out there, he took and he began to drill 29 wells over two years. And every single one came up dry. He was 40 years old. He got kicked out of college. And he was 40 years old and he was still out there hunting for oil. Three out of every four holes that he ever drilled, he never found oil in. He said that over 60 years, he believed he failed more frequently than anybody ever in the business. But now he's struck oil himself enough, his estimated fortune is $220 million. College dropout. Somebody that said, you're never going to make it. You're never going to do it. You're drilling too many holes. You're never going to be of anything. You're never going to make anything of yourself. Let me tell you this. Failure is never final, and failure is never fatal. Yes. Failure is never final. Get up. Brush the dust off your shoes and go again. In closing, we're almost there, Maxwell. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Because I was standing here, and when I went in, right into that third point, my stomach went. I was like, man, I need to hurry for myself. <laughs> Two trees. I'm going to leave you with this. Two trees. Two totally different ends of the, of the spectrum. How many of you have ever seen a Japanese bonsai tree? Ah, Mr. Miyagi. Wax on, wax off. And again, some of you are going, what? The bonsai tree, it's small. Stature is very small. In fact, most of them will only grow 15 to 18 inches. When the bonsai peaks its head above the ground, it, it, the young sapling is pulled through the soil. Then the Japanese will take and tie its taproot off and some of its feeder roots so that the, the, the bonsai's growth, look at this, the bonsai's growth is deliberately stunned. It's a small tree in stature, but it's still beautiful. There's another tree that's equally as beautiful and fascinating. I've seen them with, I've seen them myself. My dad and I had an opportunity to go see them. It's sequoias in California. And there's one of those giant trees, and it's called General Sherman. Look at this. You got it, Ron? General Sherman. 272 feet high. And it measures 79 feet in circumference. It's 79 feet around. It's so large, if you cut it down, you could build 70 houses from the one tree. 70 houses. Now, here's the difference in the two trees. The bonsai tree 
purposely stunted in its growth. And the sequoia tree is allowed to grow as large as it wants. Now look at this. Neither the bonsai tree or the general Sherman have a choice in determining how great they could become. You do. You do. There's nobody there that's going to pull you out of the ground and tie off your taproot and stunt your growth. You have a choice in determining who you are. There's no reason why I can't be as bright as what the promises of God are. But if we're going to do that, we cannot stop to think about tomorrow. We can't stop thinking about tomorrow. We have to plan what God is calling us to do and set our goals. Whatever you do, whatever goal that you set in your life, there's one goal you'd better set. And that goal is to reach heaven when you die. You better put that one at the top of your list. Because that's God's ultimate goal for every single one of us. And I pray that every one of you will reach that goal for eternity. Can you say amen? amen. Will you stand up with me this morning? I know this has not been a boo-hoo crying message this morning. This has not been one that you're probably going to run the aisles and say, i got to get my heart right. But let me tell you this. It's something that we have to be focused. You've got to take, you've got to take your life. Amen, Vivian? You've got to take your life and all of the madness of your life and begin to laser pinpoint focus your life on what God has called you to do. What He has called you to do. The questions that I asked, that, that I gave you this morning about setting your goals. Is the goal that I'm setting going to fulfill the purpose that God has for my life? Is the goal that I'm setting going to help somebody else down the road? Or is the goals that I'm setting, is there things that are wrong in there? And is the goal that I'm setting going to help somebody else? Our commission at Fayetteville Community Church is loving God and what? Loving God and loving each other. That's where we start. That's where we start in the goals that we're setting. God, let me love you more than I've ever loved you before. Give me, give me your insight, Father. Give me your wisdom to setting the goals that are ahead of me. Lord, I thank you for the vision that you've given me ahead of my life. But I ask you, Lord, to allow me to set goals that every single day would change who I am. Lord, I know there's going to be people that come into my life that try to knock me down. And I know, Lord, there's going to be times in my life where I don't make the mark. But Lord, I thank you for the tenacity that you've given me to never stop. And Lord, I pray for everyone that's in this house this morning. I ask you, Lord, that more than ever before, that you would give them tenacity for your word. You would give them tenacity to be filled with the Spirit every single day. That you would give them tenacity, Lord, to run and not be weary. That they would run and not look back the race that you've called them to. Lord, we ask you to make our lives be attractive to other people. Lord, we ask you that we can set these things up in our lives so that we can serve you better and serve our, our community better and serve our jobs better and serve our family better in every situation. So right now, Jesus, we just come to you and we thank you that we've set our eyes on the finish line. We've set our eyes on the mark. And we ask you, Lord, that every single day that we can set in front of us things that we can accomplish to further your kingdom. In the name of Jesus and everybody said.